big part of my life I spent as a gun for hire, as a creative director, as a strategist for brands, for agencies even, or governments, individuals. This all changed June 16, 2012, when my partner and I started Parlay for the Oceans. It all began with a meeting, meeting Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd, who was imprisoned in Frankfurt in Germany for protecting sharks. Interpol has issued a red notice for Echo Terrorist Paul Watson. Anyone who knows his whereabouts, contact authorities. We've been doing this for 40 years. I can't back down. This is too important. Sitting down with Paul and learning about the state of the oceans was shocking. And first I felt like, oh God, he's a drama queen. There's something so big happening and nobody talks about it. That can't be true. Actually, he was more optimistic than all the scientific data. The future is not as uh, rosy as we would like it to be. Uh, everything from species diminishment to uh, climate change, there are a lot of obstacles and they have to be addressed. I called my partner Leah in New York and we decided to stop being a design firm. And to be honest, it was an easy move because to suddenly have purpose, to suddenly have a very clear mission that is bigger than colors, logo sizes, shapes of products, timelines about productions, is a big relief. Palais is working on three major threats, the plastic crisis, the climate crisis, and the fishing crisis. At Palais, we believe plastic is a design failure. It's in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. It leaches chemicals, it sheds microparticles, but it also gases off. In general, this material is not fit for a circular economy and it's not healthy. And still, we are so addicted, we are depending on plastic, we are running on plastic today. Climate change, uh, heating up the water and making it impossible for lots of corals to survive. It is common knowledge now that we are in the sixth mass extinction event and we are losing species in rapid speed. Millions and millions of fishing vessels chasing down all life with pretty much no hiding ground anymore because we got so advanced in killing. All this paints a picture of a true catastrophe. Every one of us must break through the attitudes that now are holding us back from doing everything we can to change the way people think and act toward the ocean. To quote Sylvia Earle, a very legendary um, deep sea explorer and marine biologist, the next 10 years will define the next 10,000 years to come because we're altering the chemistry of this planet in rapid speed. The United Nations declared the next 10 years as the decade of ocean action. And all this shows that we need to move fast. When we started Palais, we were looking at all these different problems and decided to go very strong after marine plastic pollution. Because we felt that if we can make this one cause really famous, like declare plastic a superstar of a failure, that would open the door to other causes that are so difficult to communicate. Plastic has this very visual language. Everybody recognizes the shapes from their own refrigerator, from their everyday life, and it's very hard to kind of deny that you're part of the problem when you're seeing products in the belly of a whale or a bird that could be yours. Then you know that this is an alien matter that needs to disappear. We have to end plastic. In 2015, we were in the preparation of a big conference at the United Nations a General Assembly in New York and also about to announce our partnership with Adidas, the Three Stripes. So, famous for their deep roots in youth culture, sports, and fashion. And in this moment, uh, Paul Watson invited me to welcome his boats coming back from the South Pacific. 
bringing home the 72 kilometer long gill net, which they took away from poachers by chasing this illegal fishing vessel, the Thunder, for 110 days until the captain decided to sink his own ship. The poachers fled, leaving behind thousands of meters of illegal fishing gear in Antarctic waters. And this whole 400 bags is shredded gill net because we had to free the fish out of it. I realized that if we take this material and turn a weapon into footwear, we would multiply the story. The challenge was that we had to make that shoe within six days. So Alexander Taylor, who worked for Adidas at this time, designed the product. Our scientist and collaborator, godfather of green chemistry, material scientist, John Warner, transformed the net into a high-performance yarn. And within no time, we put together the first product, the first Adidas Palais product. We are in a race against extinction. Not just extinction for uh, all the other species on the planet, but for our own very existence. Out of space? OK, it's cool. But who's trying to live out there? And what's it going to do for us? It's all about inner space, our oceans, what's in them, what we put in them. We need to keep it clean. Everything we do belongs to nature. We are nature. And if nature dies, we die. People protect what they love. They love what they understand. And they understand what they're taught. We have to find a new way of doing business, and it's up to us creatives, designers, architects, scientists, to develop these new technologies. So we have to make it actually more lucrative to protect the oceans, to protect this planet, than to destroy them. So this is a highest end performance running product you can find in the industry called the Ultra Boost. The upper is made from complete ocean plastic, recovered ocean plastic, and gill net that Sid and his team recovered from the ocean behind you. So that's what the future can look like, guys. The foundation for everything we do at Palais is the air strategy. Avoid, intercept, and redesign. Avoid plastic where possible. Intercept plastic and upcycle it if you can't avoid it. And the R stands for redesign. Redesign the material. Find replacements so we can let plastic go. Palais is known for its ocean plastic program, where we turn trash that we collect all over the world into premium material. Delivering an end-to-end -end solution, really, for a problem that otherwise is very difficult to address. We found ways to upcycle that trash, and now you can use it for high-performing yarn and footwear, for fabric and fashion. It's all based on creativity, and every partner, every collaborator has a role to play. So we're identifying campaigns or developing specific missions with each organization. Together, we were running global campaigns, creating awareness and engaging thousands and thousands of consumers. It's like a Corona, for example, supported us, helped us to grow our cleanup network worldwide and to fund us um, establishing uh, chapters in, in lots of countries. With others, like American Express, we transformed trash into credit cards, putting the cars into the hand, into the wallet of millions of people, equipping them with a reminder that tells them at every purchase that they could actually make a wise decision, vote with their wallet, vote with their card. There's also so much to learn from nature from these creatures that live deep in the sea. How can we learn from these creatures? How can we learn from these enzymes? How can we adapt that to the way we're making things? And that leads me to material science and biofabrication, green chemistry. Learning from nature is so important, unlocking the secrets. How did they grow the natural world? How did they grow this planet? 
How does a plant get its color? How is a coral growing an island? Instead of being toxic and exploitative with technology, we can use exploration to learn from nature and find new ways of doing things. In 2018, we declared the material revolution at the United Nations headquarters in New York. And we compare it with the digital revolution that changed the way we are transacting, the way we are sharing, the way we are communicating. Exactly this drastic change has to happen now in the material world where we let go of all these exploitative and toxic business methods. We have to switch to a new economy. And we call this moment the material revolution. Algae, mammalian, mycelium, protein, even carbon emissions serve as feedstock for new materials. It's the time now to question all the material standards, all the design standards that were defining our industry for the last decades and entering a new chapter where we learn from nature, where we unlock millions of years of research and development and using all these creatures, all these natural building blocks to define the way we are designing. The success of the environmental movement depends on the creative community because it's up to us to show how the future can look, to establish new standards by designing desirable, attractive products, by communicating the right values. I think we can't hide anymore and say, oh, I'm not producing these things, I'm just advertising, I'm just designing, I'm just speaking about stuff. No, we are the architects of reality. And therefore, it's in our hands, really, and it's in our responsibility to define the future. In the next 10 years, we are pretty much deciding over the faith of mankind, of our own species on this planet, and we need support. So we invite you to join our movement and we are excited to explore with you what your contribution could be. Thank you for the oceans, climate, and life. Hey, I'm Sorel. I'm the founder and CEO of Parley for the Oceans. And with me is Captain Paul Watson of the Sea Shepherd. Uh, you want to introduce yourself, Paul? Not that oh, you need you, it. Earl. Yeah, thanks, Sorel. I'm uh, Paul Watson. I'm the founder of the uh, Sea Shepherd uh, Conservation Society, which we established in 1977 to uphold international conservation law. We met nine years ago, Paul, in Frankfurt. You remember that? Yeah, I was uh, detained in Germany uh, at the request of Costa Rica and Japan uh, by uh, to Interpol, and uh, you uh, came to my assistance, uh, and I had to escape from Germany <laughs> and uh, set off on a trek around the the world uh, to deal with that situation. And thanks to your help, uh, we were able to uh, you know get most of it resolved. So when you look back. We just met in this little law firm and you, you shocked the hell out of me because you were like on one side, so positive, like super positive and optimistic on the other side, very realistic. And, and you told me that 36 years out by 2048 latest, that was like based on that study, um, Ben Harpen and Boris Worm, you said that, like that then the oceans will be dead. I mean, we are looking towards a future that will be one that is based on a dead sea if you don't turn things around quickly. And that kind of made me freak out. And I called my partner in New York, Leah, and we, we pretty much stopped being a design firm that day. What was that for you when you started to be an activist back then? What was the, the moment where you understood that this will be your life? 
Well, I started very uh, young when I was 10 years old, rescuing beavers from lake hold traps, but I was also fortunate enough to be raised by the ocean. And I've seen the uh, diminishment in uh, marine ecosystems over the last uh, half century. And uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a serious situation. Our ocean is dying. And uh, it's dying for, uh, because of many factors, uh, pollution, plastic pollution, chemical, radiation, noise pollution, uh, climate change, and uh, also from uh, diminishment of species uh, because of overfishing, illegal fishing. And uh, it simply is not sustainable. And unless we uh, turn this around, then we're going to face some very serious consequences because we don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. Since 1950, we've seen a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the sea. Now, phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. If phytoplankton disappears, we all die. It's as simple as that. And most people aren't even aware that phytoplankton even exists. So that's the first hurdle that we have to overcome. But why is phytoplankton being diminished? Because of the diminishment of fish and marine mammals and seabirds, and those species provide the nutrient base for the phytoplankton, the iron and the, uh, and the nitrogen. And uh, when you reduce those species, you reduce phytoplankton. Everything is interlinked because there's three basic laws of ecology. The law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity. The law of interdependence, that all species within an ecosystem are interdependent and the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And when we steal the carrying capacity from other species, that causes diminishment in both species and uh, inter interdependence. So when I learned all that back then, I felt like, whoa, um, this is a business problem, right? Because all these issues, when you're looking at overfishing, when you're looking at climate change, and when you're looking at pollution, like plastic pollution, uh, you can always like, rooted back to um, the way we're doing business on this planet, the way we are exploiting nature, the way we are we're putting alien matter, like toxic ingredients out there. And often we felt that we are so superior to nature, we're improving nature was even the thought that people had. And today it's not looking that good anymore. I feel that it's very little time left. Um, Paul, back then you said it's like 2048 is the deadline. What do you think is, is the situation now? I mean, how much time do we have to turn things well, around. And the year 2048 came from uh, studies by Dr. Boris Worm on the collapse of fisheries. Uh, he's revised that now, and uh, he said not 2048, he says well, 2078, but it doesn't really make any difference. Personally, I think it's 2030, because we're seeing an escalation in these problems. And uh, in, in addition to uh, a diminishment of fish, we're seeing uh, an increase in zoonomic transmission of viruses, which is caused by the destruction of uh, ecosystems and diminishment of species. Uh, we're seeing the release of pathogens coming from melting permafrost. We're, we're, see, we're also seeing the release of massive amounts of methane from the permafrost, which is accelerating uh, uh, climate change. And we're now seeing that physical reality in heat domes, for instance, in the West Coast right now, and surging storms, rising sea levels. Um, it's going to happen a lot quicker than people think. And there's only for so long that we can bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening. It is happening, whether we believe it or not. The science is there. And nature is reacting to uh, all the damage that we've, uh, that we've done to, uh, to it. And, uh, and uh, we, we really have to act. We have to act aggressively or else it's going to be too late. When I uh, met you back then, and we were sitting first in Frankfurt in the law firm, and then we were, go were going together to Berlin and spending time together and, and meeting people and, and trying to do best as possible um, to campaign in Germany. Um, I learned a lot about the problems, right? And I also tried to find out where my role could be. I was very new to the, to the whole environmental movement. And then at the beginning, I feel like a dummy. And um, to be honest, I didn't even know if I will ever contribute something useful. Um, I guess that you probably felt the same at the beginning and, and you looked at me and you're like, what is this guy doing here? Um, but do you think that Palais and what we're doing um, added something to what was there before or you feel that we are just another organization? The strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity and therefore the strength of any movement must depend upon diversity diversity of strategies, of approaches, of ideas. So, you know, it doesn't really matter how you approach it, but as long as you use your 
abilities and your skills to contribute to solving the problems. And so that might be uh, through education or litigation or legislation or through direct action. Basically, when I'm, I look at Parley, I look at yourself, you've got a certain set of skill sets, uh, uh, you know, dealing with public relations, dealing with uh, communications and everything. And there are, I think that over the last uh, nine years that you've developed those uh, skills uh, and have put them to work, uh, to address major problems in the ocean, specifically uh, the major problem of plastic pollution, which is uh, much more serious than people think and uh, has, a, uh, has a potential to cause irreparable damage to, uh, to the environment and to humanity. And uh, I think that you're on the forefront of, uh, of uh, addressing that particular problem. When I look at, at you and how you enforce law in areas where nobody does, where you put your own life or the, where your team actually puts their, their lives at risk to, to protect animals out there. Um, are there moments where you feel this is too big? This is overwhelming? Um, it, you're not making enough progress or how are you approaching that? And how are you motivating yourself to continue? I don't really have thoughts like that. I, I feel that we have to focus on the present. You can't do anything about the future. You can only, uh, you can only uh, focus on what you're doing in the present and that will define what the, what the future will be. And so I don't allow myself to be deterred by uh, you know, being pessimistic or depressed about any of these things. You can only do your best. And uh, I've also found that the solution to an impossible problem is to find the uh, impossible answer. And uh, that can be found through the application of passion, imagination, and courage. I mean, the very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would become president of South Africa was unthinkable, it was impossible. And yet the impossible became possible. And I'm seeing so many young people today who are you know, really applying themselves, who are really harnessing their courage and their imagination to their passion and making a difference, making people more aware, coming up with innovative ideas, with alternatives. Uh, and uh, th this is a growing movement, probably one of the fastest growing movements in the history of humanity because it's completely global. And uh, it is, it's beginning to really make an impact and, 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 and to influence. And uh, the key to it, of course, is that we have to influence uh, people in power, people in government, people in corporate uh, uh, situations who actually do have the power to, uh, you know, to really make significant changes uh, if they um, are if they're properly um, been made aware of what those problems are and the and the fact that they can they have the power to do something about it. I mean, they need to know. They need to be inspired. They need to relate to it, right? It's again um, a question of opening a door, and I think that was. What I felt back then when we were sitting together in that law firm um, in 2012, I had the feeling that that should be my role um, to bring people together, right? To create a collaboration network and be the glue between different people that could actually drive change. And I think today, I mean, to be very honest, I could never have imagined back then that we would have governments being a member in our network or the amount of people in the creative sector that say, you know what, I'm going to donate my, my time, I'm going to donate my skills, I'm going to help, I'm going to invent with you, or scientists or laboratories and the big brands. I mean, the big brands, like the ones we, we kind of uh, want to work with us, that they would become like corporate activists nearly, that they would start like turning around and doing things differently. And even if they can't change fast, as fast as we want them to change, they still like put on the flag and say, we want to end this. We want to end plastic. We want to end these problems. And I see now, and I think that is um, for me very surprising that even the fashion industry that I found very resilient against change uh, and impossible to change at the beginning, I now meet uh, a CEO of a major brand and he says, oh, I'm vegan since three years. Um, I hear people turning around and saying, you know what? I'm looking for purpose. I'm looking for a new way of doing things. I, I don't feel right anymore. I don't want to contribute to the destruction. And you have over the last decades, I think 40 plus years now, you have like won so many volunteers, so many people that went uh, on operations, um, that went on the boats or they're working in offices or on the streets. Um, did you find it at any point difficult to win people to support or did you ever have actively um, to seek for people to support you or to work with you at Sea Shepherd? 
I actually don't put a lot of effort into uh, trying to convince people to see the problem, uh, but you know, we do what we do and hopefully that sets uh, an example. Uh, example for yourself, for instance, uh, you haven't really changed, uh, you know, your skill sets, your abilities, what you're good at. All you've done is uh, uh, switch lanes. And uh, instead of going along the path you're going, you're now going towards uh, the future in a, in a different way and uh, a, a more constructive way. And so that's what everybody really should do. You know, if you're a photographer, a lawyer, or a teacher, or whatever like that, just say, okay, I've been doing this, but who, what am I doing it for? Am I doing it for me? Or am I doing this to make it a better world? And, What's my intention? Uh, yeah, and uh, I think that's really what changes things. Uh, people coming to the realization that we're all part of a of a movement that can make a significant change. But it's also more important than that. It's very. It's actually a movement that involves the very survival of of humanity, because um, if we do not address these problems, we're simply not going to survive. And, um, you know, that will sound that sounds very uh, frightening in many ways, but at the same time, it is a reality. And the best way to deal with reality is through uh, real and concrete uh, solutions. I think that you're always and that's for me always like so inspiring and um, actually gives me energy. It's not even inspiring. It gives me energy and when I'm with you or when we spend time or when we talk that I don't feel doubt. Um, I, I, it kind of takes the whole idea of doubt and fear off the table when I'm like uh, in encounter with you. <laughs> because normally, you know, when um, the day starts, I spent the first one, two hours thinking. I mean, it's, it's this moment where I wonder if I'm, I'm using the time right, if I'm even doing the right thing. And honestly, there's often there are long moments of despair in the mornings, you know, when I really feel like, my God, um, there's so much to do. Um, and I can't shoulder it. And I think it comes from my original profession as a designer where you had to fix these problems. There was nobody else. You know, you had to make sure that you deliver a final product, that you deliver something that works. And if you don't, then you're a loser. You lose your job and people look at you and you're, there's this pressure of like performing and as an, as an individual. And when we met back then, um, also that disappeared for a second. And I felt like, oh my God, that could be a different way of, looking at that um, because you didn't, you didn't have that. You, it felt that you are part of a movement and yes, it forms around you, but you're still not responsible for it all. You just do, as you said before, the best you can. And you, it's not up to you to solve it all. And I remember that moment and it was a beautiful moment for me because I felt, oh my God, I want to be part of something bigger. I don't want to feel any more alone. I don't want to feel anymore that everything's on me. And but still, it, it, it sneaks back on me pretty much every day. You know, like I have to deliver something. And, and also fear, to be honest, you know, like fighting your own fear and coming into this mind space of positivity um, takes a lot of my time, to be honest. And you told me a story back then um, uh, how you lost fear uh, when, when you were like a kid. And or at least there was this moment where you decided that fear doesn't really help you. Well, fear and panic aren't going to really save you. I mean, you have to face that. Once you've conquered the fear of dying, then you have no fear of anything. I think one of the problems is that people tend to be afraid of failing, you know, of losing and that. But that's really more of an ego thing than anything else, you know. Uh, you really have to concentrate on your what, you, what you're good at, what you're accomplishing, what you're contributing. Uh, none of us have the, are going to do this by ourselves, but we can certainly put in a significant effort and also inspire many, uh, many people uh, by, you know, you do something successful, it's going to inspire other people to do the same. And uh, it really doesn't matter uh, who you are. I mean, you could be a 16 year old girl like uh, Greta Thunberg and reach millions of people. I mean, it's, there's so many things that you can, that you can do and uh, and really, really may make a difference. But uh, nobody should ever fall into uh, doubt or despair or be pessimistic uh, uh, because really there's nothing, there's nothing beneficial. There's nothing positive about that. Focus on what you can do. Yeah, I mean, and believing your ideas and, and trusting your instincts, right? I mean, often you don't see the outcome and you don't know where it leads towards, but you feel it's the right thing to do and it's the right direction and you keep pushing. And I think Palais, for example, uh, 
we didn't plan to be where we are today at all. You know, it was, it was a pivoting process and we just followed our instincts. And also the landscape changed. Um, people are changing as well. And today, like nine years later, I see that there is a big difference in how people like look at the environment. They're not anymore so self-confident. They're not anymore like, they're not feeling safe and, and assured anymore that everything will be fine. And people don't even trust the governments anymore to fix it because I think we all experienced that they might not be able to do that. And it's up to us. So it's in our own hands. And I think that's, this changed. Um, I mean, you saw way more change in the last 40 years. It's like 30 more years than I dedicated to this. What is the most drastic difference from when you started, or let's say the, when, you, when you worked back then with Robert Hunter and all these, um, the crew to, to start, uh, for example, Greenpeace, and when you compare that with today, what's the biggest difference um, between these two moments? The biggest difference, I think, is that people are more aware of uh, the situation. The problem is, is that uh, societies have become much more repressive and, uh, you know, things we could do in the 70s, 80s, we can't do today uh, because uh, the powers to be really uh, respond to to uh, to the problem by becoming more more repressive. Here's the problem. Politics is the art of the possible. And when you're seeking impossible solutions, you're not going to find it in politics. Uh, change comes through the passion, courage and imagination of individuals. And uh, but if enough individuals uh, move in that direction, it's going to influence government. Uh, and they'll have to bend, they'll have to give in. But here, the problem is, you know, we know what the, we do know what the problems are. But when you, you say this to a politician, the politician's reaction is, well, I can't say that. I'm not going to get elected if I say that. Or uh, if I say, if you say to a corporate leader, well, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not going to sell my products if I do that. So or my have, shareholder kicks me out or there are a thousand reasons not to change. Yeah, so we have to, we have to, motivates society and at the same time society changes and motivates uh, motivates us <laughs> you know again things that were very radical 20 30 years ago are extremely mainstream now <laughs> and so it, it's always a uh, very difficult to keep on that radical edge because suddenly you find out everybody's agreeing with you and that's you know <laughs> and i've always felt that being an environmentalist or, an, a, con or a conservationist that you have to uh, say things Pop your game all the yeah, time. People don't want to hear what you have to say. They don't want to see what you're doing. You know, we're here to rock the boat. You know, when people start agreeing with you, you got to start thinking, hmm, maybe I better push it up a little more here. <laughs> and that. But um, again, it's, uh, I don't think people are really, really aware of just how serious uh, the situation is, just how threatened our ocean is. Um, at the COP21 conference in Paris, I said that if we want to really address climate change, we have to leave the ocean alone. We have to allow the ocean the opportunity, the time to repair the damage that we've done to it. And it will repair that damage. But, uh, you know, we're not leaving it alone. Uh, we have to stop industrialized corporate fishing operations, these giant super trawlers, these 100 uh, mile long, long long lines, 100 mile long gill nets, bottom trawlers. These are the things which are destroying uh, the ocean. Now the fishing industry will come back and say, oh, you know, a billion people are dependent upon uh, upon the ocean to eat. And that is true. But we're not talking about those billion people. We're talking about the corporate industries which are strip mining the ocean to feed uh, the Western nations with luxury goods. Nobody's going to stop a canoe going out from the Ivory Coast and catching a fish. <laughs> what we want to stop are the giant super trawlers. Yeah, whack home cleaners. I mean, there are 10 million fishing vessels out there like chasing, giving, giving animals like very little place to escape. I think the biggest problem is that um, the economic models that we have, they are always built on ideas, right? And the way we are running business is, or people are running business is to keep existing success systems up and running. Like, oh, we learned that we can make a, a table out of a tree, then we can keep uh, cutting down trees. Uh, oh, we learned that we can sell a piece of meat in a supermarket, then we keep killing animals. and. I would really compare that with technology shifts. You know, we learned that, oh, it's great. We can do business with a fax machine and with a phone and with mail. And suddenly somebody came along and said, oh, let's switch to digital. And nobody is using a fax machine anymore now, right? I mean, there was a better alternative. 
And some people that are also interested in, in doing business and making money just saw more potential in the future technology than in an old technology. And I think it's the same here now. You know, some people or more people are tending now towards alternative energy sources, alternative food concepts like plant-based diet. And there is a business growing around that. It's extremely fast growing industry sectors. And I, when, I, when I met you first back then in this law firm, I felt like we humans created this huge killing machine that is running our economy. And if we want to stop that machine, we have to more or less design a machine that does the opposite mm. and replaces this killing machine. Right. So for me, it's really a, a question of innovation and, and establishing new standards and trends and making it extremely attractive to consumers um, to opt out of the exploitative old ways of like killing animals, exploiting animals, um, tossing chemicals into the wild and doing all these things that just burn up our health. Uh, that's how I see it. For me, it's an innovation task, right? And to be honest, that made me also very optimistic because suddenly I was again in my home territory of like, yes, change is pain. You have to convince people, you have to seduce them. And you have to put alternatives in front of them that they find interesting and they're curious about. Well, it's very true. And uh, we're finding that, uh, you know, for a plant-based uh, uh, meats, for instance, uh, so-called meats, are actually a, a rising industry that people had a lot of doubts about for a, for a long time, and now they're in serious competition with uh, with with real so-called meat, uh, so to the point where even Burger King and McDonald's are now marketing uh, marketing these. So uh, yeah, uh, we have to have the the courage and the vision to to see that there are alternatives and to push those alternatives to create them and to uh, and, and to market them. Yeah, and to collaborate, I feel that. At the beginning of Palais, I was I tried first to be extremely pure. I was like, I was like, that's very European. I, I saw you, we met, and then I looked into whole the whole environmental movement, and then I tried to do everything right. You know, like, oh my God, we have to have a foundation, we have to be pure. And then I realized that's totally wrong. I don't want to be that. You know, I want to I want to work with sinners. I want to work with the people that are actually destroying. I de probably don't want to be seen with them, but I want to be on a table and talk to to all these guys and and win them over. Because I think there is nothing more powerful than if somebody who stands for destruction suddenly puts another flag up and says, you know what, we're turning around. And you might first think it's greenwashing. You might first think they're just pretending. But at some moment, they're just an example of how things can be changed. And Adidas is an example for that. You know, at the beginning, people were like freaking out that I would work with Adidas. Um, they wrote like, they had like signature lists against me. Um, and today it's one of the biggest activists against plastic out there. Their whole campaign is like based on, on ending plastic. And that, that is, I think we should not close the doors. We should open up. And I think that's something what I saw happening with your organization in a very fast pace as well. You started at some point to collaborate with governments, to collaborate with security forces and you became a network of collaboration. And, and I like that a lot. Well, first of all, you have to be immune to criticism, you know, really don't care what the, uh, don't care what the critics say about you. If they tell I you, do too much. you know, I do anyway, but you're right about uh, what Sea Shepherd began in 1999 with a partnership with the Galapagos National Park to protect the marine reserve has now evolved into partnerships with numerous uh, nations in Latin America, Africa, and Europe. So uh, we now are like just last week, we uh, were able to arrest uh, illegal fishing vessels in the waters of Peru and oppose the that massive giant Chinese uh, fishing fleet that's out there. Uh, we've arrested some 65 poaching vessels in West African waters and uh, we're removing uh, fish aggregating device and ghost nets out of the uh, out of the Mediterranean out of the coast of England uh, in the Baltic and uh, so it's a global it's a global movement which is inspired by this understanding that uh, we can make a difference so uh, we just have to we have to act and uh, and I think that uh, where we were once considered a somewhat of a radical organization we're now uh being embraced by governments and some and some companies and that is uh you know who, who say who see what we're trying to do in fact so much so that there's actually courses on what sea shepherd does at the united states naval college uh and uh, which illustrates that non-government organizations can make a difference to uphold international conservation law and it's especially 
important for non-NGOs to do that because governments, for the most part, are their hands are tied because of all sorts of international agreements and everything like that. The laws are there, but they can't do anything. But uh, we, uh, we can intervene where they can't. Yeah, and I saw that. I learned that with the government because when I started, um, I felt very skeptical around intergovernment organizations and government organizations, you know, and we worked then um, a lot with the United Nations, with different um, departments there. Uh, and now we're working with the World Bank. But I realized that the most of the people I meet in these intergovernmental uh, organizations, they came to these organizations with the best of intentions. They, they really wanted to change the world. And then they got, I would say, stopped and blocked by all these like diplomatic um, roadblocks or um, of course also career mechanisms where it's not very healthy <laughs> if you're like um, going too aggressively about your beliefs, right? Um, but I feel that these organizations and now also the governments we are, we are speaking to and working with, they would love to do way more aggressive stuff, but they can't. Their, their hands are tied. And I think there is the beauty of um, public-private partnerships where we can do things, we can pick up things and we can say things where they cannot yet or they never can. And we can also be way more efficient you know, I mean, that's that's how we uh, what led to our partnership with the World Bank and with these countries in South Asia, that we were operating and we were solving problems in countries like the Maldives, for example, for a friction, like a small part of the budget they have, because we got all the people to help. You know, we, we won their hearts, not their not their their greed. We came into these countries and, and convinced um, key people to convince their people, and suddenly a whole country would support us and people would contribute and would work for free or would give assets or do whatever they can to support the vision. And um, while these big organizations often come in and they say, I give you a big loan, I give you a lot of money and, and then it becomes a revenue source or they don't have enough knowledge to break it down to an um, operational level and to really see what is working, what is not. And I think there is a huge potential of like um, really partnering up well, NGOs have the um, advantage of being able to cut through a lot of the uh, bureaucratic red tape and, and, and to get the job done. I mean, this is something that goes back, uh, you know, centuries when the French and the, uh, the British and uh, the Spanish uh, used to uh, employ privateers in order to, uh, to get their agendas across because they couldn't actually blatantly do it themselves. So uh, it's sort of like that in, in, in a way. We're able to go in and, uh, and do things that uh, the government simply can't. And in many cases, the governments are, are supportive of what, what we're doing, but quietly. You picked the Jolly Roger. You're flying the pirate flag. Um, this is an example of privateers that establish their own rules. Why, why are you so um, drawn towards the class and society called pirates? Well, when people in the 90s were calling us pirates, I said, okay, well, if you're going to call us pirates, we'll be pirates and got our own Jolly Roger flag. Uh, but really, let's go back, you know, look at the history of piracy. Piracy, pirates got things done. I mean, when Captain, uh, you know, Nelson was sent to the Caribbean to deal with piracy, he couldn't get his ship out of port because of lawsuits brought against him by British merchants who were upset about interfering with their profits from piracy. So uh, who ended piracy in the Caribbean? It was Henry Morgan, a pirate, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, pirates were the first to be opposed to slavery. Blackbeard used to uh, attack slave ships and free the slaves. And, and he'd give them an opportunity to either go ashore or if they joined his crew, they could rise to their level of their own competence, which was unheard of in the 17th century. Pirates uh, were the first to democratize their ships. Uh, and it didn't matter what your gender was, what your race was. And that uh, Far, far ahead of their time. So I think there's a history of uh, pirates actually displaying, uh, you know, some very forward thinking. And people say, yeah, well, they're, they were thieves. Yeah, sure. They stole gold from the Spanish. But where did the Spanish, the Spaniards get the gold? They stole it from the Indians. So is that really, <laughs> is that really all that bad? I think it was just desserts. I remember Anne Bonny, the famous female pirate who once said, uh, you know, said, they said it's a death penalty for piracy. And she says, and thank God for it too. If it wasn't for that, every idiot it would be doing this. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's like creating your own reality, right? Um, you just your own value system and finding people that buy into that and say, you know what, I like that concept better than the other ones. And suddenly there is a, like a, a movement or a group forming. 
And I would compare that um, with innovation, really, because when you're looking at economy and you're looking at the disaster that economy, as it's been run today, is causing, it all started with ideas. Mm -hmm. So somebody had an idea and somebody said, oh, I want to burn fossil fuel and I'm going to run a car with ethanol or I'm going to become a carpenter. I mean, lots of ideas or I become a butcher. And I think when you, when you really want to change that reality and you want to change the source of the problem, you have to kind of replace these ideas and come up hey. with better ideas that are more up to date and that stand for a total different way of, of being on this planet. And that is not being somebody who kills and destroys, but somebody who is collaborating with nature. You have to have the audacity to push forward those ideas uh, and uh, to ignore criticism. For instance, if your objective is to get to the moon, first you need a rocket. But to get a rocket, you're going to send off the first one. It's going to blow up. The next one's going to blow up. Next one's going to crash. The next one is going to... Finally, finally, after a lot of trial and error, you reach the moon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's how everything works in that way. You have to throw out these ideas uh, these strategies and uh, nine times out of 10, they're going to fail. Yeah. And you but, learn from each other's. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a pivoting time, process. 10th time will bring you, bring you to success, but nothing is achieved without experience the failure in your attempts to achieve it. Yeah. It's, it's what you need to learn. I mean, you try, 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 you try from all sides. And at some point you don't fail anymore. You actually succeed. You made right. a miracle happen. And mm -hmm. I think this encouragement is missing. I mean, kids have that, right? But adults unlearn that. Um, we unlearn, or I would say we are, we are trained to unlearn to take these risks. Uh, it's good not to take risks. And that's the biggest challenge when it comes to driving change that I see is create this culture where it's allowed to take risks, where it's rewarded to take risks. Right. Because if you don't take risks, you don't innovate. You don't move. You just stall. It's absolutely necessary. I mean, we need persistence. We need determination. And we need the courage to take the risks that you're, uh, you're, you're mentioning there. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to be criticized, then you do nothing. <laughs> and uh, so I think that uh, we're seeing the emergence of uh, many, many leaders, especially amongst young people today, uh, who are taking this message and a diversity of uh, directions and achieving a diversity of successes. And uh, this is going to get stronger and stronger. I think that the movement we have right now to address climate change, to address pollution, to address uh, our, our destruction of the ocean, of the environment is the fastest growing movement in the history of the planet or the history of humanity. And uh, it, it, we're constantly recruiting more and more people every year. And it's a, it's a movement that has to, has to, to win because if it doesn't, we, we all perish. We just simply do not live on this planet uh, and continue to act like there's uh, no limits at all. It's, you know, we have to understand that uh, the earth as a spaceship, this life support system that maintains us <clears throat> is only maintained because of the, of the, the crew of engineers who keep it running, uh, who provide us with the oxygen we breathe, the food we eat, regulate climate and temperature. And if we continue to murder those engineers and diminish their numbers, then uh, the life support system is going to crash and we're all going to die. I think that's where I am um, taking my, I would say, energy from, is the belief that we all feel the same. We are translating it differently. We are processing it differently into thoughts. But in our belly, in our like pure instinct level, we, we all feel the same things globally. And now with the pandemic more than ever, there is an urgency. Uh, our future is not safe. We're not on the right path. And mm -hmm. we should be scared because we are heading towards our own destruction. And I believe that out of this now, and I see it happening finally, to be honest, is this explosion of new ideas coming. And also people liberating themselves from that anxiety and saying, you know what, I'm going to take this on. I don't know what is coming out of it, but I'm going to take this on independently from anybody else telling me what to do. Right. And I think this encouragement, this inspiration encouragement is what we have to deliver as activists. We have to say more or less, whatever you want to do, just like nurture, nurture and, and grow these ideas and, and protect them. And don't run after them blindly, but test them and, and, 
and just like believe in your own ideas. I think that's a very powerful message to send. And um, the other thing is, Paul, um, where are your, where are you taking your your inspiration from when it comes to the oceans? Um, is there a moment or is there a place that you're going back to um, to reconnect with the sea? Well, I think I take my inspiration from the fact that. Uh, there's so much disappearing. Uh, we're seeing such a diminishment in diversity and that it's all those living, breathing creatures in the sea. That's what inspires me to protect them, to uh, prevent their extinction, to, to prevent their suffering. That's what inspires me more, more than anything else. Uh, we simply cannot live on this planet without all of these other species. I think the problem is, is that for centuries, humans have developed this viewpoint I call it anthropocentrism, this idea that we're better than everything, that we're more important, that we're dominant over everything. We have to return to the idea of biocentrism, which indigenous people understand. And that is this understanding that we belong to, this, to everything, we're interdependent with everything, that we're not any more important than the worms or the bees or the fish or the trees, that we're equal. And in many ways, many cases are more important than we are because they can live here without us, but we can't live here without them. And unless we learn to live in harmony with all of these other citizen species on this planet, then we're simply not going to survive. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, survive by ourselves. We are, we're a symbiont uh, community. All the species living on the planet are symbiotic. That means is we need each other. Uh, we can't exist without them. Yeah. And I think there is, Another aspect, uh, there is the necessity and there's the empathy. Um, and yes, we want, and if you love these animals, then you want to protect them. You don't understand why people just stab them to death and how divers that go down to see these majestic creatures come back, uh, speed them up somehow and bring them home as a trophy. I simply can't understand that. And I think it's dead wrong. But there's another aspect I feel that motivates me. And that is the moment you are really opening up to life out there that is non-human. The moment you are, you're, and it's not, for me, it's not happening too often, but when it's ha happening, then there is this beautiful being of a feeling of like blending in, like melting nearly into this like whole world. And, and also I feel that there is a lot coming your way when you do that, when you're really going on eye level with nature, you're really interacting with animals, when you're really like, not seeing yourself as a superior life form, but like going on true eye level, I feel there's something very beautiful happening. There's an exchange happening that is not in words expressible, but it's nearly energetic. And I feel at this moment, there is a certain truth that you can't find otherwise. And for me, it's just peace. I think this moment of making peace with nature is the most amazing feeling you can have. And I try to reconnect with that as often as I can. I think peace comes through the realization that you're, uh, you're part of the whole and uh, you're not an alien to the planet. Uh, most people live on this planet are actually alienated from nature and therefore they're, they're walking around like a species that simply has no place. It doesn't belong. Visitors. And that. And uh, we're rapidly turning the planet into uh, a more and more inhospitable place, uh, not just for a lot of other species, but also for ourselves. So it's not really a question of just simply loving other species. It's a question of being concerned about our children and our children's children and what kind of future they're going to have. You know, as the uh, Iroquois have a, an, a saying that you make no decision in your life until you take into account the impact, the consequences of that decision on all future generations. Because as conservationists, what we do today uh, will have an impact on what the world will be like 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, a million years from now. We have that power to determine what this planet will be a million years from now. Well, and uh, will it be a beautiful place or will it not be? Actually, I'm not really too concerned about this because it's, you know, no matter what happens- It's gonna survive us. <laughs> no what happens, the planet's gonna survive and probably in yeah. a better state, you come back a hundred million years from now and everything's gonna be beautiful again. We just simply won't be here. We're gonna just die out. <laughs> I mean, we survived five major extinction events in the history of the planet. I'm sure we can overcome another one. So yeah. it's really not a question. It's really a question of saving ourselves from our, our own folly, saving ourselves from um, the fact that we don't really understand where we live and how to, uh, how to survive. And how special this place is because there are a lot of rocks out there and uh, I don't want to be uh, sitting in a, in a 
base camp on Mars. I mean, well, the other thing I, I try to instill in people is this understanding as well, you know, what is the ocean? Um, most people think it's the sea, but it isn't. It's the planet. This is the planet, the water planet. It's water in constant circulation. Sometimes it's in the sea, sometimes it's in ice, sometimes it's underground, sometimes it's in the clouds, and sometimes it's in the cells of every plant and animal on the planet. Water that is now in your body once blowed through animals and plants and was in the sky and was in the ice. We are, what is it? What is the ocean? We are the ocean. This whole planet, this whole living planet is the ocean, and we're part of it. And the ocean is this endless universe. It's a deep space where we can fly around and experience anti-gravity. Um, it's, it's a beautiful magic place, which we know so little about. And then we are still trying to go out there in the, into outer space scenarios to find life again, um, while it's so beautifully unfolded here. I, I, mean, think, I think it was T.S. Eliot who said, man shall not cease from exploration and the end result of all of his exploring will be that he'll find himself where he began, but this time he'll know where he is. Paul, it was a fantastic conversation today. Always is. Um, oh, well, grateful you, for this friendship and the inspiration. And thank you for waking me up nine years ago and making me an ocean warrior. Oh, thank you, sir. Always a pleasure.